Biloxi, Mississippi, a quiet southern town with a burning core of corruption. In 1987, its secret burst violently to the surface, leaving two prominent citizens dead and ripping the top off a grand conspiracy. On Mississippi's Gulf Coast, a judge and his politician wife are murdered in their home. The killer left few clues. It looked like a professional hit, and the investigation led nowhere. But the FBI refused to give up. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Until we could prove that federal laws had been broken, our hands were tied. It would take years to break the conspiracy of silence and reveal the tangled tale of corruption. Biloxi, Mississippi, Monday, September 14th, 1987. It was a typically warm summer night in this quiet Gulf Coast town. The workday was over, and most residents had retreated to the tranquility of their homes. Like most of their neighbors, State Circuit Court Judge Vincent Sherry and his wife Margaret were unwinding after a long day. Vincent Sherry was a prominent judge in Biloxi. Margaret was making plans to run for mayor. Both were fixtures at Biloxi's social and community functions. They were a happy couple who had raised three grown children. Tomorrow they planned to visit their daughter out of state. Their life together seemed ideal. They were just settling in for the night when an unexpected visitor came to the door. And brought their perfect world to an end. The Sherrys were supposed to be with their daughter, so no one realized anything was wrong until two days later when the judge failed to show up in court on Wednesday, September 16th. Calls to the Sherrys' home went unanswered. His colleagues at the court phoned Pete Halat, Vincent Sherry's friend and former law partner. Morning, Pete Halat. But he hadn't seen yeah. or heard from the judge either. Well, he's supposed to be in court. When did he leave? I don't know. No, wait, you let me call him at home and I'll, I'll figure out where he is. After he left a concerned message on the Sherry's answering machine, Halat felt he'd better check on his friend personally. Oh, I got the machine. Judge! Judge, it's Pete. They're looking for you in court. Is everything okay? On his way out, he asked his junior partner, Charles Legere, yeah. to ride with Charlie. him. Charlie! Hold on, time to settle up. And I need some help, so let's go. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's go, let's go. Listen, I'll give you a call back, okay? Yeah, bye-bye. I figure if we go together, the two of us... 
As they drove, Legere tried to make conversation. Well, that seemed distant, perhaps concerned about the judge. Both of the Sherry's cars stood in the driveway. Well, the car's here. I don't like it. I don't like it. Well, the car's here. He's supposed to be in court. Halant asked Legier to go to the house while he asked a neighbor if she'd seen the couple. Just go ahead. Legere rang the doorbell, but no one answered. He saw that the last two morning newspapers hadn't been picked up. Pete Halat, I'm a partner. The neighbor told Halat she hadn't seen the Sherry's for a couple of days, which she thought was odd since both of their cars were in the driveway. When Legere tried the Sherry's door, he found it unlocked. Something wasn't right. Hey, Pete! Pete! I think that's unusual. Yeah, I was uh, just knocking on it and the door opened up. Palat, concerned by the Every open door, door open, cautiously stepped inside. A few steps in, he made the gruesome discovery. Judge Sherry had been gunned down in his own home. What's wrong? They called the police. Authorities arrived to find the body of Vincent Sherry at the front of the house. In the back bedroom, they discovered Margaret. Because the couple was so prominent, the murder investigation became top priority. Detectives contacted the FBI's Biloxi field office. Though the FBI would not yet be officially involved, they offered the use of their agents and forensic laboratory. Inside, the police began scouring the crime scene for clues. They conducted blood spatter analysis to determine projectile angles. If they could figure out where the murderer had stood when he fired the shots, they might be able to reconstruct the crime. Okay. Inspector Robert Burris, a crime technician with the Biloxi Police Department, helped process the scene. He discovered a possible clue in the den. There was blood trailing from his feet, actually going down between his legs a little ways, uh, back to where he was laying. There was blood spatter on um, a double sliding glass door that was right beyond his head. And further examination in this room, I found some um, small pieces of foam rubber. Burris didn't see where the foam rubber could have come from. A search of the house led him to one conclusion. Now this foam rubber had to have been brought into the house. We examined every piece of material in this house and every room of the house, all pillows, mattresses, everything else. There's no foam rubber tore up in this house. It was brought into the house. It does have gunshot residue on it. And basically about the only way it can get there is for a bullet to be fired through it. For Burris, the significance of the foam rubber was obvious. The killer had used a homemade silencer. Investigators dusted for fingerprints, but found none of any value. They found nine spent 22 caliber shell casings from a semi-automatic pistol as well as the bullets used to murder the Sherrys. The position of the shells indicated that the shots had been fired in rapid succession. 
but most striking was how well the killer had covered his tracks. Nothing at the scene pointed to the killer's identity. So what do you think? He did his job well, and his mission was clear. The lack of evidence in this house, such as uh, items stolen, uh, a struggle occurring, the absence of forced entry, uh, no ransacking going on in the house whatsoever, a person came there for one thing, that was to kill the two Sherry's. Special Agent Keith Bell from the Biloxi FBI field office agreed that this was a professional job. The Sherry's had been assassinated. And the crime scene appeared to be very limited as far as evidence remaining, which meant it was well planned, well executed, and professionally done. A uh, small caliber weapon had been used. Uh, the uh, foam rubber indicated that uh, perhaps a silencer had also been used, and the sherries had been uh, shot in the head. So uh, it, it seemed to be a very professional job. A multi-agency task force was assembled with Special Agent Keith Bell among its members. Investigators would spend days processing the crime scene. They grappled with a single question. Why had the Sherrys been murdered? That was one of the main questions, uh, that being why were both Judge Sherry and Margaret Sherry murdered? Because it was fairly obvious that Judge Sherry could have been killed during his morning or afternoon jogs around the neighborhood. Uh, so it was a real mystery why Margaret had been killed. Investigators believe the answer might lie in the controversy over Biloxi's future. Some civic leaders hope to transform the sleepy southern town on Mississippi's Gulf Coast into a flashy resort where casinos would attract tourist dollars. But with strip clubs already established in town, Margaret Sherry felt Biloxi's small town charms were threatened. And the casinos would attract a criminal element. As a candidate for mayor, she had made powerful political enemies by trying to keep gambling out. Agent Bell wondered if Margaret was killed to silence her protests. Margaret had been so outspoken politically in the community. Uh, she was known to be anti-gambling. And uh, if elected mayor in 1989, she had planned to close down the remaining strip clubs in Biloxi. So there was always the possibility that she might have been the target, rather than Judge Sherry. The task force would investigate Margaret's political enemies, but first, they'd question the Sherry's friends and neighbors. Someone in the neighborhood must have seen something. But even people who'd known the Sherry's for years were reluctant to talk fearing the specter of Biloxi's emerging criminal underworld. The Sherry murders brought a dark cloud over the city of Biloxi. Uh, many of the citizens in Biloxi were uh, afraid to openly express their opinions. They saw that Margaret Sherry, who had been quite vocal and quite outspoken in political circles, had ended up dead, as had her prominent husband, Judge Sherry. So many citizens uh, after these murders uh, were hesitant even to be interviewed by FBI agents or by local police officers because they basically did not want their names tied in to anything to do with this case. If people wouldn't talk to the authorities, perhaps they would talk to Lynn Spazito, the Sherry's daughter. After being notified of her parents' murders, Lynn rushed to Biloxi from her home in North Carolina. Determined to find justice, she questioned everyone in the neighborhood. One family friend gave her a crucial piece of information. He described a suspicious car and driver in the neighborhood on the night of the murders. She took the lead to the police. They identified a man 
who had seen a suspicious Ford Fairmont driving in front of the Sherry home on Monday night, September 14, 1987. Investigators tried to determine the identity of the driver based on the witness's description. Their search came up empty. But a few days later, not far from the Sherry's home, investigators found an abandoned car, a Ford Fairmont. A check on the vehicle's identification number showed it had been reported stolen the day before the murders. Police also learned that the tags on the car were not registered to the car. Realizing that this vehicle was probably the killer's getaway car, investigators towed it to a police garage to examine it further. Somewhere in the car, they hoped to find a key to the killer's identity. Less than a week after the brutal murders of Biloxi couple Vince and Margaret Sherry, investigators received their first promising lead. They recovered an abandoned car, matching the one witnesses described seeing the night of the murders. After contacting agent Keith Bell about the discovery, investigators processed the car for clues. Inspector Robert Burris found something peculiar. I was processing this vehicle, and one of the things I noted, the dome light had been dismantled and the bulb taken out of it. In other words, if you open the door, you ain't got no light. Both of the sun visors were in the down position. Whether you're riding around daytime or nighttime, you ain't gonna be able to see the people's face in it very well. Investigators believed more than ever that this was the car used by the Sherry's killer. Anything found inside it was labeled, packaged, and shipped to the FBI labs in Washington, D.C. But FBI lab examiners would find nothing of evidentiary value. After Agent Bell arrived, he examined the license tag more closely. He discovered it had its own story to tell. It was determined that the tag on the Ford Fairmont had been stolen from an abandoned vehicle in 1984, actually three years before these murders occurred. So what it meant was someone had removed the license plate, likely in 1984, had kept the license plate, and then when this major crime in the city of Biloxi was uh, to occur, they pulled it off the shelf, so to speak. With no other solid evidence, investigators hoped that following the trail of the stolen tag might lead to the killer. It was traced to an apartment complex where the original car had been abandoned three years earlier. Investigators contacted the apartment manager, who told them that prior to having the vehicle towed, he called a friend to come and strip it for parts. The manager's friend, was a man that agents knew by name and reputation. Biloxi locksmith Lenny Sweatman. He was the last person to be seen near the car. Sweatman belonged to a loosely organized group of criminals the FBI was investigating in connection with another case. The group was known as the Dixie Mafia. FBI agent Keith Bell had connected the car used in the Sherry killings to Lenny Sweatman. Now, Bell wondered if the Dixie Mafia was linked to the Sherry murders. If Sweatman had a part in it, Bell believed that other Dixie Mafia members couldn't be far behind. He began looking into Sweatman's associates. What that meant to us immediately, uh, those of us familiar with the criminal associations on the coast, was that if Lenny Sweatman was involved in getting the tag for the hit car, then quite likely his close personal friend and longtime associate Mike Gillich, the strip club owner in Biloxi, might also be involved in these murders. That's all right. Sometimes you know how it is. Oh, thanks. Oh, beer. All right. Gillich, who owned three strip clubs in Biloxi, was well known to local law enforcement. 
He was currently under investigation by the FBI in connection with a Dixie Mafia operation known as the Lonely Heart Scam. See, it gets to him. But Special Agent Bell needed a thread that connected the two investigations together. He started by familiarizing himself with the Lonely Heart Scam. It was run out of Angola prison in Louisiana by a man named Kirksey Nix, the incarcerated kingpin of the Dixie Mafia. No, the first model. Nix would run ads in gay magazines, asking for money to help fictional gay men get out of trouble with the law. Through the scam, Nix was hoping to generate enough money to solve his own legal problems. He was serving a life sentence for murder. From his jail cell at Angola, he coordinated what we've been referring to as the homosexual scam, which generated hundreds of thousands of dollars from individuals around the country, uh, as well as some people in Canada. Uh, with this money, he intended to buy his way out, or attempt to buy his way out, of his uh, Louisiana prison sentence. Believing that they were helping gay men out of trouble, people who read the magazine ads would wire or mail money to a nearby Western Union. Nix would then call his contact on the outside, Mike Gillich. Gillich would then dispatch his bagman to retrieve the money. Gillich made sure that the scam money was distributed to Dixie Mafia members and safely stashed away for Kirksey Nix. Take care. In the coming months, investigators developed more evidence in the Lonely Heart scam, but still had no direct link between these conspirators and the Sherry's killers. A year into the investigation, the murder case threatened to stop. As the years stretched to 16 months, the Sherry's daughter, Lynn Spazito, grew increasingly frustrated. In January 1989, she hired a private investigator to rev up the inquest into her parents' murder. He said he could make out the man. I'll give him a call, and I'll be on this case this afternoon. The family had wanted very much to have a quick resolution to the case, but by uh, early 1989, there'd still been no arrest. And of course, at this point, the FBI had not formally uh, entered the case. The lack of official FBI involvement hampered Bell's investigation. So when the private investigator paid him a visit, Bell welcomed his assistants, hoping they could share information. The two were old acquaintances from the private investigator's days in law enforcement. Since Agent Bell was unable to act officially, the private investigator would pursue a lead that looked promising. He would interview another Angola inmate. The private investigator and Bell hoped the inmate at Angola could finally link the Lonely Heart scam and the Sherry murders. He uh, met with all the right people, and because of his knowledge of the Dixie Mafia uh, and from what he had learned from law enforcement authorities on the coast, he did go over to Angola and did talk to the right person over there. The inmate's name was Bobby Joe Fabian. He was another known member of the Dixie Mafia, doing time for kidnapping and shooting a state trooper. Fabian claimed he had not been involved in the Sherry murders. But he had learned that fellow inmate Kirksey Nix had been. Fabian told the private investigator that Nix had had Judge Sherry killed because Sherry had allegedly stolen money from Nix's Lonely Heart scam. That wasn't all. He said Nix had been told of the theft by none other than Pete Halat, Sherry's former law partner. Halat the man who had delivered the eulogy at the Sherry's funeral was now implicated in their murders. Palat officially represented Nix on legal matters, but
But Fabian said Halat's role in the Lonely Heart scam was criminal, not legal. Halat was one of the people receiving money from Nix for safekeeping through Mike Gillich's bagman. Don't forget to pick up Nix. And the ties between the outlaw and the lawyer went deep. Kirksey Nix's girlfriend and accomplice, LeRae Sharp, worked in Halat's office. Fabian said both LeRae Sharp and Pete Halat were stashing money from the scam in a safe deposit box for Kirksey Nix. And he said the amount had reached six figures. Thanks to Fabian, the link between the murders and the Lonely Heart scam had been made. And not only had Fabian given investigators a possible motive for the killings, he was also able to supply the name of the alleged hitman, an ex-con named John Ransom, who was believed to be living in Georgia. But tracking down Ransom would take time. Anytime law enforcement uh, people get together and start talking about notorious Dixie Mafia members, John Ransom comes up quite early in the conversation. He's a longtime alleged hitman for the Dixie Mafia. In August of 1989, two years after the Sherry murders, Agent Bell now had enough evidence to warrant a full FBI investigation into the killings. Accompanied by the Sherry's daughter, Lynn Sposito, he approached the United States Attorney and the FBI with a demand to officially open the case. So with the tying in of the scam to the murders, we knew we had some federal violations involved. We have uh, wire fraud, we had mail fraud, and we perhaps had a hitman traveling from Georgia to Mississippi to kill the Sherry's. Uh, it was decided to open an official FBI investigation and join with local authorities in the investigation. By now, however, suspect Pete Halat, Judge Sherry's former law partner, had been elected mayor of Biloxi, with a key suspect in such a high position. Investigators encountered new roadblocks. It became very difficult for the FBI to share all of its information with the local authorities. We are not uh, saying that the local police were corrupt. What we are saying is that Mayor Halat put his own people in as director of public safety and as police chief. So we were somewhat circumspect on what we, we shared uh, with local authorities during that time period. In August of 1989, as investigators attempted to unravel the truth about the Sherry's murders, informant Bobby Joe Fabian made a surprise move. He told his story about the Sherry murders to the TV news. Fabian hoped that by bringing attention to himself, Kirksey Nix would be less likely to have him killed for cooperating with authorities. Along with the report, the station broadcast a mugshot of John Ransom, the alleged hitman in the Sherry case. When Charles Legier, Pete Halat's junior partner, saw the photo, it surprised him. He recalled seeing Ransom outside the Sherry Halat law offices a few weeks before the murders. Legier shared his information with the task force. Major Randy Cook of the Harrison County Sheriff's Department took Legere's statement. Legere said the reason he remembered Ransom was Ransom stepped off of a curb and came up to him and asked him where had spent Sherry's office at. When Legere was interviewed, Jimmy. he recalled there was something unusual about the way Ransom stepped off of the curb. Ransom had a prosthesis on one leg.
Investigators learned that Ransom was now in a Georgia prison, serving time for another murder. When questioned about the Sherry murders, he refused to cooperate. As Cook further questioned Legier about the day he and Halat had found the bodies, an important detail emerged. Legier remembered that Halat had walked into the Sherry's living room seen Judge Sherry's body and said, Vince and Margaret are dead. Cook relayed this to Agent Bell. And what was interesting was that Margaret's body was in the far back bedroom of the residence. And according to Chuck Legier, Pete Halat did not have time uh, other than to briefly enter the front of the house and would have no way of knowing that Margaret's body was also in the very back bedroom. In October of 1989, two years after the murders, Agent Bell knew Halat was involved, but he still lacked enough evidence for an arrest. Even so, he felt it was time to confront Mayor Halat. It would be a quiet warning, man to man. And I let Mayor Halat know that I thought his knowledge of the Sherry murders was much greater than uh, what he had shared with law enforcement authorities up to that point. And I recall also telling him that the FBI would continue working on this case until it was totally solved. Uh, my recollection is he smiled and did not have much else to say. As a lawyer, Halad knew Bell would need more concrete evidence in order to secure a conviction. What he likely didn't realize was the depth of Bell's commitment to bring him to justice. Three years had passed since Judge Vincent Sherry and his wife Margaret were murdered in their Biloxi, Mississippi home. FBI Special Agent Keith Bell had connected the killings to members of the Dixie Mafia and to Judge Sherry's friend and one-time law partner, Pete Halat. The alleged trigger man, John Ransom, was refusing to talk. In January of 1990, Agent Bell and Major Randy Cook of the Harrison County Sheriff's Department drove to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary to question another possible accomplice. This is special A man named Bill Rhodes, Rhodes, a known associate of John Ransom, was willing to cooperate. He told them that in early 1987, Ransom had contacted him about driving the getaway car in a crime to take place in southern Mississippi. Ransom had said a judge would be murdered and that the pay was $10,000. There were certain promises made to Rhodes that, by Ransom that I know certain people in Biloxi that if you'll help me on this and you'll have the run of Biloxi anytime you want it. So in March of 1987, Rhodes went to Biloxi and met with Ransom and a man named Pete. It was Pete who specifically asked Rhodes and Ransom to do the hit. Rhodes said he also met with Mike Gillich, the Biloxi strip club owner, who would supply the money once the hit was done. But five months later, before they could do the job, Rhodes was arrested on an unrelated bank robbery charge, and Ransom got cold feet, afraid Rhodes would turn on him. The information helped the case inch forward, but Agent Bell and Officer Cook still felt that Ransom held the missing pieces. Another year would pass without much progress. In late 1990, the investigators went to the Bostick Correctional Institute in Georgia, where Ransom was serving time. Finally, Ransom agreed to talk. He admitted that he delivered a 22 caliber pistol to LaRae Sharp, Kirksey Nix's girlfriend but Ransom insisted that he did not do the job. Based on what Ransom said, 
LeRae's involvement was starting to look bigger than simply stashing scam money in a safe Sir. deposit box. All finished? Finished. Thank you. Good. Through his contact with Sharp, Nix learned that the investigation was heating up. He worried that his girlfriend might talk, so he tried to head off the problem by putting out a contract on her life. But in late 1990, Agent Bell arrested her for her participation in the murders, inadvertently saving her from Nix's gunman. During a polygraph test, Sharp denied her involvement in the Lonely Heart scam and the Sherry murders. But the machine called her bluff. When Bell and his team added her statements to their existing stacks of evidence, they were ready to bring indictments against several key players. No. Mike Gillich, John Ransom, Ray Sharp, and Kirksey Nix were charged as conspirators in the Sherry murders. Notably missing from the list was Pete Halat. The case against Halat would have to wait until they had enough evidence for a murder conviction. For now, the FBI would look to convict the others on conspiracy to commit murder. So many of the questions came up, why didn't y'all indict Pete Halat early on when you indicted everybody else? Well, at the time, we didn't have the hard evidence that you would have to have to arrest a mayor and prosecute him. The conspiracy trial produced several key witnesses that would help investigators piece together the complex scheme. Robbie Gant, Gillich's bagman for the Lonely Heart scam, testified for the prosecution. His testimony helped prosecutors link the Sherry murders to the scam. All four defendants were found guilty. Nix was given 15 years in addition to the life sentence he was already serving for murder. Gillich also received a 15-year prison term. Ransom got 10 years, and LaRae Sharp won. With these conspirators behind bars and the Lonely Heart scam no longer operational, Bell moved on to his next objective. We decided not to end the Sherry investigation after the 1991 uh, initial convictions because at that time we had not proven who had actually uh, shot the Sherrys. And also Pete Halat had not been indicted or convicted at that point. And we all felt strongly that Pete Halat had played a, ma a major role in the scam and in the murder plot. So we were determined to continue the investigation to see if we could get enough evidence to indict and convict Mr. Halat and the actual shooter. In late July of 1992, Agent Bell got the break he was looking for. Following the conspiracy trial, Mike Gillich was desperate to find a way out of prison. He contacted one of his associates in Biloxi Hello? and asked him to approach Robbie Gant with an offer. Okay, well, whatever you say. Gant told Agent Bell about it. And the associate had offered Robbie Gant $20,000 if Gant would recant his testimony against Gillich and sign a false affidavit stating that he had been threatened by me to testify against Gillich, uh, to testify falsely against Gillich. Gant agreed to wear a wire and get the offer from Gillich's accomplice on tape.
Gant met with him in Mississippi. This time, Gant's tape was rolling when Gillich's associate reiterated the bribe. Gant accepted as Bell had instructed. Now, Bell had the evidence he needed to turn up the heat on Gillich. Just the man who could tell the story from the inside. By 1993, six years after the double murder of Vince and Margaret Sherry, FBI agent Keith Bell had put four members of the Dixie Mafia behind bars. But he still had no formal murder convictions against those involved. And Mayor Pete Halat, the suspected mastermind of the case, was still free and running the city of Biloxi. In fact, the year before, Mayor Halat had broken ground on the city's first big casino. The victory for our town and our people. The press still hounded Halat about his involvement in the Sherry murders, but he remained adamant about his innocence. Bell continued to work his plan. He used the bribe Robert Gant had recorded on tape to level another charge against Mike Gillich, already in jail. Now Bell indicted Gillich for witness bribery and witness tampering for trying to buy off Gant. And that did the trick. No doubt the most important uh, turning point was in October of 1993, when Mike Gillich finally decided to cooperate and tell the story of this whole case from an insider's point of view. And that's what really uh, allowed us to bring final resolution to this investigation. After the years of painstaking work Bell had spent on the case, it was a satisfying moment. Finally, it seemed his patience and ingenuity were paying off. Gillich was in no hurry to accrue more jail time. Bell's relentless pressure had persuaded him to cut a deal before the bribery trial even began. The Dixie Mafia member would tell what he knew about the murders. Mr. Gillich has Maybe now, Bell could get the convictions he knew were long overdue. But for a career criminal like Mike Gillich, Adjusting to life on the right side of the law wasn't easy. At first, he tried to bluff his way out. Of course, it always takes some time, a period of weeks, to develop some degree of uh, trust and to be able to uh, communicate with someone like this who, for the first time, has decided to leave his lifelong role as uh, a criminal and start cooperating with the FBI. When deception didn't work, Gillich had no alternative. He had to tell the truth. Now, for the first time, Bell heard the story from an inside source. Gillich knew all the details. Mike was the center point. Mike knew Kirksey Nix. Mike knew Pete Hallett for years. And in fact, when Kirksey Nix was looking for an attorney over in the coast area to represent him on various matters, Mike Gillich introduced Nix into Pete Hallett. He confirmed that Pete Hallett was indeed behind the plan to murder the Sherrys and that the plot grew directly out of the Lonely Heart scam of Angola prison inmate Kirksey Nix. Some months before the Sherry's deaths, Halat had closed the safe deposit box he and Nix's girlfriend, Laray Sharp, had access to, effectively cutting off her access to the money. He then transferred the money into a box only he and Judge Sherry could use. Motivated by greed, he stole $100,000 cash from there. As Nix's trusted accomplice, Halat could blame the theft on Judge Sherry. 
Next, he went to Mike Gillich with news of the theft. Mr. Gillich stated that Pete Halat approached Mr. Gillich himself in late 1986 and told Mr. Gillich that much of the money was missing, supposedly around $100,000. And Mr. Alat blamed Judge Sherry for taking the money. Uh, Mr. Alat knew that Kirksey Nix would be very furious about this. It is not known who ordered Margaret's death, but as a fierce opponent of corruption, she posed a threat to the underworld forces hoping to control Biloxi. With Margaret dead, Halat could be free to run the town. Gillich said that he and Halat planned the murders. Ransom and Rhodes provided the murder weapon. But when they passed on doing the hit, Gillich found a replacement, a Texas-based petty criminal named Thomas Holcomb. Holcomb would be paid $20,000 to murder Judge Sherry and his wife. Gillich had also helped provide the car with the help of locksmith Lenny Sweatman. In October of 1996, agents arrested hitman Thomas Holcomb in Texas on murder charges. Peter, that same down. month Go also down. saw the arrest that Agent Bell had anticipated and worked nine years to achieve. I'm an innocent man, and you're gonna put the cuffs on me? Let me read you your rights. The arrest of Pete Halat for the murders of the Sherrys. Kirksey Nix and LaRae Sharp were indicted on 52 counts, including fraud, money laundering, and murder. Halat was tried and convicted in the summer of 1997, a full decade after the crimes were committed. He was sentenced to 18 years in federal prison. Also tried and convicted were Kirksey Nix and Thomas Holcomb, the hitman. Both were sentenced to life. LaRae Sharp, Nix's girlfriend, got five years. I think a lot of citizens in Biloxi now realize that there are a lot of dedicated professional law enforcement people who will do everything they can to uh, protect the community and work hard to solve major crimes. Uh, perhaps the uh, legacy, you might say, of the case for the criminal element is that they realize after seeing this case that they can commit a crime one day and think they're getting away with it a year later, but it could come back uh, 10 years later and get them. While the Sherry's killers were finally brought to justice, Margaret Sherry's dream of a Biloxi free of gambling was never realized. Instead, Biloxi has become a resort town filled with casinos and neon lights. The sleepy southern town is gone forever, along with the woman who lost her life trying to save it. So you got what I need? Yeah. On the streets of New Orleans, All right. drug money bought the city's cops. 
officers became the strong arm of drug lords, brutalizing anyone who dared speak out. With police tainted by greed, undercover agents would have to put their lives on the line to bring down the corrupt officers who hid behind a shattered shield. In a city of Washington and narcotics, the drug lords have all the power, even over the police. Corruption in New Orleans grew like cancer, eating away at public safety and threatening to destroy the city. Lured by easy wealth, crooked cops began breaking the laws they were sworn to uphold. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. When it became clear that the police could no longer police themselves, the FBI had to get involved. It was a case where the line between friends and enemies became dangerously blurred. New Orleans, 1993. Tourists packed the city looking for a good time, not all of it legal. Cocaine was in demand and the dealers cashed in. It was a violent business. For protection, the drug lords turned to those whose duty was to serve and protect. The cops. Officers lined their pockets while enforcing the will of the dealers. They controlled turf like thugs, terrorizing innocent civilians. Agent Stan Haddon of the FBI's Public Corruption Unit in New Orleans was aware of the growing problem. Our intelligence told us that there was a great variety of corruption uh, taking place among uh, many different officers on the department. However, uh, this, the one thing that seemed to be the most pervasive was that officers were out there working with drug dealers on the street, were protecting drug dealers on the street, and were stealing money and drugs from drug dealers on the street. One such drug dealer was Terry Adams, known on the streets as Scaboo. He was a small-time operator who was being extorted by Officer Sammy Williams. So you got what I need? Come on now, give me what I need. But this time, the protection money Scabu paid Williams wasn't enough. On Christmas Eve, the officer demanded that Scabu pay him $10,000 cash by 6 p.m. If Scabu failed to show, Williams threatened to beat him and guaranteed him 20 years to life. That evening, at 5 p.m., Special Agent Stan Haddon was finishing up some last-minute work. About to go home, he took one last call. It was Scabu. His time was running out. He told Haddon that he was being blackmailed, but didn't have the $10,000 the corrupt cop was demanding in less than an hour. When Scaboo contacted me, we realized that that was our best chance to do something about police corruption. And I immediately arranged to meet him and, and debrief him in person. Uh, there was no way we could get everything together by 6 o'clock. Um, by the time I met with him, it was uh, 30 minutes before the deadline. Yeah, I feel pretty good about that. Um, Haddon and his partner quickly hashed out a plan. This is, I think, the best one we've got. Scaboo would meet the officer as arranged, but he'd be wearing an FBI wire. The agents couldn't arrange $10,000 on such short notice. Scabu would have to convince the cop to accept smaller payments over several meetings. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Okay, they could be rough. Well, you know that. You worked with them. Yeah, I have. Assured by Haddon that he would be under constant surveillance, Scabu took his position. Officer Sammy Williams was still on duty when he arrived with a prisoner cuffed in the back seat of his cruiser. Williams 
drove Scabu to a deserted spot behind a seafood market. He ordered him to throw the $10,000 into the trunk. Scabu told Williams he only had $3,000 now, but would pay the rest later. If the cop arrested Scabu, he'd never get his payoff. Agents hoped Williams would agree to meet him again for more of the money. He did, and the FBI had it all on tape. Hadn't believed this one incident would lay the groundwork for exposing more corruption in the New Orleans Police Department. Our main objective was to try and create a strategy that would enable us to prosecute as many bad officers as we possibly could. In the days that followed, Agents, along with prosecutors from the United States Attorney's Office, began to plan their operation, codenamed Shattered Shield. Assistant U.S. Attorney Al Winters would advise agents every step of the way on what would be needed to convict the dirty right. cops. Probably, probably we were involved really from day one. We met with the case agents on numerous occasions and discussed exactly what we were interested in being developed as far as evidence in, in the case. As with most corruption cases, the FBI's strongest evidence would likely come from wiretaps. According to Special Agent Karen Jenkins, an FBI wiretap specialist, securing them isn't easy. Title III is a court-authorized intercept or wiretap. It's very difficult to get one approved. It's a lengthy process, very time-consuming. Basically, we have to have approval by FBI officials to get one, and beyond that, we have to have the review and approval by Department of Justice officials. Finally, a federal judge will make the final determination as to whether or not one is authorized. After delivering two more payoffs to Officer Williams, Scabu had won his trust. Now the FBI seized the opportunity to take the operation to the next phase. Scabu would approach Williams with a proposition. The volume of drug business was going to increase, and Scabu would need more cops to protect it. If Williams was interested in higher payoffs, he would need to hire more dirty cops to handle the expansion. Williams took the bait. Scabu met with him for another recorded payoff in mid-January 1994. Don't forget now. But this time, Williams showed up with another officer. He turned out to be Len Davis, Sammy Williams' partner. It wasn't surprising. Davis was known in the projects as a gangster with a badge. Reviewing the tapes hadn't discovered a problem. Both Davis and Williams used the coded language of the drug trade. To make charges stick, the FBI had to record the officers using language that a jury would understand. Hadn't pressed Scabu to get Williams and Davis to use words like dope so there'd be no doubt at trial. But when Scabu told the cops, the dope is in, Davis suspected something was up. If you're, uh, if you're in the police business and somebody starts using words that are that overt and that plain, that immediately makes you suspicious that this uh, person is trying to set you up. Davis shoved Scabu into the car and told Williams to drive. The agents would be too conspicuous on the deserted streets. If they pursued the cops now, they would put Scabu's life at greater risk. The only thing they could do was sit patiently and listen to the wire. When the car came to a stop, Davis's rage ignited. He yelled that Scabu was never to say the word dope again. 
They immediately took him to a, a deserted location, aggressively searched him. Uh, you can hear the Velcro ripping loose on his clothes and stuff. And uh, that was a very tense moment. Right Davis insisted that he wouldn't go to jail for careless talk. He and Williams stripped Scaboo looking for a wife. Scabu was sure he was going to die. Miraculously, they never found him. He's clean, he's clean, he's clean. He's clean. I'm not going to jail behind you. Their trust was restored. You understand me? Scabu continued his protection deal with Davis and Williams. For the next job, the cops drove him to a store where a drop-off was to take place. Inside, Scabu checked a bag at the counter. He passed the ticket to an agent posing as a buyer, who then retrieved the bag. Williams and Davis watched as each transaction went down. They were promised $1,000 for every kilo of cocaine they protected. For them, the deals meant easy money. Davis and Williams met Scabu behind stores and alleyways for the protection payoffs. The FBI recorded every word. Gradually, Operation Shattered Shield was building a solid case against police corruption. The recordings continued into the spring of 1994. Once agents were sure Davis and Williams were solidly on board, the FBI prepared to expand the investigation. With still more cocaine to guard, Williams and Davis would need to recruit more dirty cops. Federal agents hoped to snare every one of them. But agents knew the officers may become suspicious of Scabu's rapidly growing drug business. They needed to bring in a big time dealer, someone whose status as a kingpin would explain the larger shipments. You like some? Sure. Okay. Hadn't called on one job. Uh, an FBI agent trained specifically JJ for working here undercover. To represent a drug kingpin from, from up in the East Coast. At that time, I was in New York City and I'd been contacted uh, to come down to just uh, be interviewed and go over the actual case. A lot of times they'll, they'll be looking for a certain person, height, weight, you know, color, or whatever, um, to infiltrate or get into a certain group. Known as JJ, the agent would act as Scabu's cocaine supplier, proposing to use New Orleans as a hub to store and distribute his product nationwide. I was a high-level drug dealer. I played that role and I had ties where my operation uh, was in both Miami and in New York City. With the arrival of JJ, Shattered Shield was about to grow from a minor drug business to a booming enterprise. Jackson was one of the FBI's best undercover agents. He was smart and experienced but his life would be in the hands of the informant, Scabu, who had no training. Jackson needed to build complete trust with Scabu, or they'd both be dead. The informant, because he lives that world, is probably the, for me anyway, the most important, because he himself has been there. He's been around these people. If he's not believable, it's not gonna work. And I think uh, that was the big thing for me down there, was to make sure that uh, we were gonna be believable. Jackson and Scabu rehearsed their roles again and again, preparing for the real test with Davis and Williams. Jackson, federal agent from the north, and Scabu, a southerner who had dealt drugs all his life, had to forge a common history. Their story would be that they had met in the army. After their stint was up, they had kept in touch. They hashed and rehashed details of their friendship, habits, fake memories that they'd have to know cold, and when to say them. They were dealing with criminals who could run thorough background checks 
and who were free to use deadly force. We knew that whatever we had, we had to keep it simple, but we had to make sure that we remembered certain things. The biggest thing I thought that helped us was my initials, my nickname. So no matter how many times they would ask him, what's his name? He believably said, because he only knew, <laughs> JJ. In April, the FBI was ready to introduce JJ into the operation. He arrived at a hotel carrying what was supposed to be a drug payment of $100,000. For the first time, Williams and Davis caught a glimpse of the big time dealer. Their perceptions would be critical. The first encounter was in the Sheridan Hotel. They were going to stand at a distance and just observe. It was another test to see if they were willing to do what they were going to do. Hey, I don't know how it's going to work. They could arrest me right now and take me off and, you know, I'm down. You know, because it was supposed to be drug money. So uh, it was a test. Scabu told the cops about JJ and his plan to use New Orleans as a transport hub for his cocaine business. Davis and Williams carefully studied JJ's every move. Jackson was creating his character before their eyes. It would become his full-time identity, and it would have to hold up under scrutiny. Everything depended on what the cops thought they had seen, and if they believed the cash exchange was genuine. The plan worked. The cops were convinced that JJ was the real deal. The FBI was now poised to take Operation Shattered Shield to the next level. By the spring of 1994, the FBI's Operation Shattered Shield, targeting New Orleans police officers involved in the city's drug trade, was in place. Posing as a drug kingpin named JJ, undercover special agent Juan Jackson worked with Scabu, the drug dealer turned FBI informant. Scabu rented a hotel room for JJ to meet officers Len Davis and Sammy Williams for the first time. What's up, man? What's up? That was showtime. That was a big deal. On any first meeting with any bad guys, you know, a million things are going through your mind. I mean, are you going to be believable? Is anything going to happen that's going to change their attitude? It's either going to work from here or we're all going to go home. Playing the street-savvy drug dealer, J.J. insisted that everyone strip to establish trust. Sure. For this first meeting, Jackson didn't wear a wire. He didn't need to. The room had been thoroughly wired by the FBI for audio and video recording. Then, in a bold gamble, J.J. invited them to search the room. Because they were cops, Davis and Williams knew how to find a room wire. But J.J. bet his life on the FBI's technicians. The cops never found the wires. J.J. was beginning to build trust with the officers. But officers are trained to sniff out deception. I mean, you got to think that I'm meeting with two police officers. Because of the guns, you also always have to remember the threat. You always have to be conscious of the threat and remember exactly where they are and what they're going to do and where the weapons are. With the cops convinced for the moment, J.J. began to discuss the proposal approved by case agent Stan Haddon. And he played the role of a big-time drug dealer from New York who was using New Orleans as a transshipment point, simply as a storage point, where he could bring dope in, leave it for a while, have it guarded and protected by the officers, and then thereafter have it shipped out to other points unknown. For their role, J.J. promised to pay them $5,000 every day the cops guarded the warehouse. Williams and Davis were enthusiastic about the plan, even offering advice. The cops urged J.J. to hire young drivers, give them company uniforms with name tags, and put signs on the sides of the trucks to resemble legitimate companies. For the FBI, the meeting was flawless. The meeting went off without a hitch. Uh, they bought J.J.'s uh, act. 
they believed him completely, and they also said the magic word uh, cocaine, which uh, got it clearly established on tape that we were talking about the officers protecting a, a drug uh, operation. From that main meeting, the plan moved quickly. The FBI found a warehouse that met their needs, far from public view and rival drug dealers. JJ and Scabu met Davis and Williams for a walkthrough. JJ and Scabu would meet with Lynn Davis and Sammy Williams at the warehouse for what we call the pre-deal meet. There at that meeting, they would discuss when the dope was coming in, how long it was going to stay in, in town, and how much money JJ was going to pay for the officers to guard the dope. Once inside, Davis told JJ that he had half a dozen more officers lined up to guard the cocaine shipments. They would work in 10 hour shifts. Uniformed police outside guarding payloads of cocaine inside. Up to a quarter of a million dollars worth in each load. At that June meeting came the first big payments from JJ. More than $10,000. Everything is going smooth. But one aspect of the warehouse plan bothered Assistant U.S. Attorney Al Winters. Basically, what we told the agents, unless we had evidence, irrefutable evidence, that these people knew they were guarding cocaine, we couldn't prosecute it. Right. Because the cops stood guard outside the warehouse, they could later claim they didn't know that drugs were inside. I think having some sort of video or photograph Hadn't had to find a way to prove Davis's recruits saw the drug shipments. His team mulled over ways to bring the drugs into plain view. We need them to duplicate themselves. Here, I'll take those. The officers would have to be recorded seeing and discussing the shipment. Shipments were delivered to the warehouse one weekend every month according to schedule. Then, in mid-July, the FBI sent a shipment that the guards didn't expect. With one load already in the warehouse, an FBI agent dressed as a courier brought another shipment. The driver shocked the guard cops by unloading the cocaine in plain sight. This was too overt for Len Davis's crew. They didn't want to see drugs at all. They didn't want the vehicles outside the warehouse unloading drugs and stuff where the officers could actually see it. Quickly, get down here. The cops called Sammy Williams on a cell phone JJ had given him. Williams called JJ, and JJ and Scabu raced to the warehouse. J.J. responded like a hot-headed drug dealer. I was arguing with this guy. I mean, we were actually screaming at each other. What, what are you doing? We, you, know, we, you know, where are you? Whatever. And he's observing this. Because a police officer calling Lynn, telling him all what's going on and how this doesn't look good. To the cops, this whole drug operation was starting to look dangerously unprofessional. Concerned, the driver made another call. Sammy Williams arrived to straighten out the problem. JJ explained it was the driver's screw. He asked that the cops escort the van to the city limits right away. Despite the risk, the episode worked. It showed that the cops knew what was inside the warehouse. This ain't right. What's going on? And it was all video. Just let them go. Just let them go. But the episode raised doubts for the cops. Either JJ was an amateur, or he was part of a sting. Either way, they'd be watching him more closely now. Shattered Shield wore on into the summer as all of New Orleans baked. About 
every degree that I met. In August, guarding the warehouse proved hard duty. The cops complained of the wear and tear on their engines from running the air conditioning all day in the heat. They wanted a vehicle that was more comfortable, that could also endure the long hours, perhaps a van. The officers asked Len Davis to provide one, and Davis brought their request to JJ. For the investigation, it was a huge break. The sweaty cops had just handed the FBI a golden opportunity. It was a stroke of luck. One day, Lynn uh, approached me and said that the officers were complaining that uh, they're running their cars in air condition, and the cars are starting to overheat, you know, they're burning gas, you know, on and on and on. Once we were able to rent the van and, and, and put the listening device inside, we were able to hear a lot more conversations. The FBI quickly filed the paperwork to get court-authorized wiretaps for the van. Technicians carefully installed state-of-the-art microphones. They had to yield top sound quality for months with no maintenance. The van was a perfect Trojan horse for getting inside information. I picked this out myself. New, new the shiny new van the made the officers suspicious. They wondered if anyone could have tampered with it. It ain't nothing wrong with it. They wanted to know exactly where Davis had gotten the vehicle. I've never seen this vehicle before. Because JJ had so completely won Davis's trust, Davis told the cops that he himself had rented the van. Is it all right? He vouched for it. That calmed their fears. I picked it out myself. What do you think? Len Davis didn't want anyone upsetting his flow of payments. I picked it the up FBI myself. would soon learn just how ruthlessly Davis guarded his interests. After three months of shattered shield, more and more New Orleans cops came under the FBI's investigation. Len Davis and undercover agent JJ met often to discuss drug shipments and payoffs for police protection. Davis made frequent threats. They'll tell you, we run this city. We do whatever we want to do. They let me know that very many times. If they feel like they want to shut it down, they'll shut it down. But Davis liked the money. JJ knew that as long as the money flowed, he would never shut the operation down. Davis called the shots for the other officers. He recruited and set the schedules using his cell phone. But he complained about his bill. So JJ offered Davis a new cell phone, free of charge. It was one more way the FBI could record the cops' knowing involvement in drug trafficking. The wires the FBI had planted in the warehouse van were paying off. One night, two guards on the graveyard shift brought prostitutes to the van. The wires picked up everything, even the cops' sexual indiscretions. When Jenkins heard this, she immediately phoned JJ. The situation was a chance to catch the cops off balance. JJ called Davis to complain and to see what they'd get on tape. He told Davis he had checked out the warehouse and found that the cops weren't protecting him. J.J. wasn't paying cops to have sex. He ordered Davis to straighten things out. Davis arrived in a fury. His henchmen were threatening to ruin his whole operation. Lynn was upset. Lynn was a businessman through and through. Lynn wanted it to work exactly one way. And he was really upset that I was upset. And uh, he got up, he got up, he came out there and, and just kicked everybody out. JJ's call brought Davis down on him hard that night. But the episode triggered deep suspicions among the dirty cops. They now felt sure that JJ was the problem and believed they could run the operation better themselves. They discussed ways to kill JJ. Their plans alarmed Agent Karen Jenkins. 
When I heard those conversations were they were threatening to do harm to our undercover agent, it sent a chill down my spine. It scared me. Um, before I came to New Orleans, I had worked with JJ in another office, so I knew him personally, and I was very concerned. Despite the threats to his life, JJ was resolute, keeping the cops engaged with plans to further expand the operation. He promised Davis that the largest shipment would arrive before Christmas. After that, he would move the deliveries to another part of the city. All the time, JJ had to draw out more evidence on tape without making Davis suspicious. He was very careful. He watched everything. He paid attention to everything I said. There were conversations where we'd talk, and I'd use the word cocaine. He would count the times I used it. He would tell him, Jay, you said cocaine five times. Jay, you said kilos five times. So I had to be careful. At the same time, Haddon and his team had to defuse another plot they overheard. The cops were threatening to kill the couriers and steal the cocaine. The agents scrambled delivery times and mapped new routes to and from the warehouse to keep the cops off balance. With so many dirty cops, the FBI couldn't make a clean sweep from the outside alone. Agents would need someone powerful in the police force to be a strong ally. Despite the danger of leaks, they decided to seek help from within the New Orleans Police Department. October 1994 brought fresh changes to New Orleans in a new police chief, Richard Pennington. So, how do you like our first? Pennington was an outsider from Washington, D.C., hired in the hopes of reforming the Crescent City's crooked police force. Actually, why don't you have a, have a seat? The FBI invited the new chief for a meeting. This is not all good, Then Haddon introduced J.J. He informed Pennington that Operation Shattered Shield was uncovering corruption deep in the force that he was about to head. His cooperation would be critical for the success of Operation Shattered Shield. On the streets of New Orleans, Davis and Williams were still on active duty, cruising their territory. Len Davis had a long list of public complaints against him. During their rounds one night that October, Davis and Sammy Williams patrolled the Desire housing project. Seeing the pair of cops approach, two youths took flight. Williams chased one teenager down, bludgeoned him, and left him bleeding in the street. At that moment, Kim Groves, the victim's aunt, decided that police had terrorized their neighborhood long enough. That. I'm going to pay the bill. Is that what be done? The next day, Groves, a 32-year-old mother of three, filed a complaint against Lynn Davis and his partner. She cited the pair for police violence. An officer alerted Davis about the complaint. You want to know his name? Officer Davis, do you know him? Yeah, this is definitely a... Assistant U.S. Attorney Mike McMahon saw the report. She reported not only Sammy Williams, who did the actual brutality, but Len Davis as well, who, who had nothing to do with that pistol whipping. And uh, at that point, uh, Len Davis became uh, uh, enraged. For Davis, Grove's complaint came at the worst possible time. It would bring unwanted attention just as the new police chief was coming on board. I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get him. Len Davis vowed to get revenge. The same day that Kim Groves filed her complaint, Richard Pennington was sworn in as New Orleans' new chief of police. That marked the start of Shattered Shield's final phase the shift from an FBI effort to a partnership with a city desperate to clean house. That very night, Agent Jenkins recorded several conversations that would show just how rotten some of the city's men in blue had become. The first call was cryptic. 
Hours after Pennington was sworn in, Len Davis made a call on his cell phone. He gave an order to an Look, unknown man. I need you to do a 30 for me. Yeah. The FBI taped the conversation, but Grove. because Davis spoke in modified police code, yeah. agents didn't know what it meant. While they attempted to decipher it, agents recorded a second, more disturbing call. This time, the unknown man called Davis. As they spoke, a police dispatcher announced a murder in the Desire housing project. The victim's name, Kim Groves. When Davis heard the news, he cried, Rockabye. It was the triumphant cry of a killer. When he later heard it, the call shocked Assistant U.S. Attorney Mike McMahon. As soon as he confirmed the name of Kim Groves, Davis shut off the radio and then on the, um, uh, the wiretap conversation, uh, over the cell phone just exulted in a primal scream of delight that indeed Kim Groves uh, was dead. When agents reviewed the tapes and checked the phone records, they discovered that the man who spoke to Davis was Paul Hardy. Davis had asked Hardy for a 30, a police code normally used to report a homicide. But that night, Davis used it as an order for the murder of Kim Groves. Canvassing the projects, agents quickly learned that Hardy was a known drug dealer who led a small let's gang go, of thugs. With the help of two accomplices, Hardy acted quickly, coldly, and for just $300. Sped away over a bridge, Hardy threw the barrel of the gun into the canal and handed the body of the gun to an accomplice for safekeeping. What's up, man? When the FBI realized Davis's role in the murder, agents grew more concerned for JJ's safety. J.J. met with Davis soon afterward. He looked carefully for signs that Davis was anxious or upset. Yeah, what's up, he saw man? none. The murder of Kim Grove seemed to have relaxed Davis. J.J. still had to play his part, the role of a drug lord. Though uneasy, he was careful not to talk about the murder. I wanted to ask a lot of questions about it. I couldn't. The only thing I'd ask him was, is there anything different happening since the last time I was here? He said no. And we went on just like nothing ever happened. Is he a cold-blooded killer? I could probably do you in a minute, yeah. Having seen what Davis and his cops could do, J.J. had every reason to believe that he could be next. He was unaware that they were already planning ways to kill him. Days after Len Davis ordered the murder of Kim Groves, the FBI learned of more threats by Davis's men. A New Orleans police officer assisting in Operation Shattered Shield received an anonymous threat. It came with Kim Groves' obituary. The message was clear. Death would come to those who talked. That day, Stan Haddon learned of still more threats against J.J. and the other agents. Agent Jenkins had recorded five cops at the warehouse plotting to kill the couriers and J.J. Then they would steal the cocaine and sell it themselves. Haddon had no choice. The FBI had to wrap up the operation before it was too late. Uh, once we realized that uh, the lives of our undercover agents were at serious risk, uh, then we had to react to it. We had to do something. The FBI needed to move up their plans for the big shipment J.J. had promised to Davis, a cocaine shipment so large that it would require a half dozen more cops to guard it, but hadn't needed a location unfamiliar to the cops, a place where the FBI could mobilize quickly. 
He and his team scouted the Mardi Gras truck stop on Elysian Fields Avenue. The spot had good highway access. It also posed little risk to the public in the event of a shootout. The cocaine would arrive on an 18-wheeler, then be loaded into cars and escorted by the cops out of the city. Every detail had to be mapped out. The plan would require the coordination of 85 agents positioned strategically along the routes. When Davis put out the word about a huge November 18th shipment, he enticed new recruits. As a load of cocaine worth a quarter of a million dollars arrived, Davis, Williams, and their crew stood ready as protection. Agents posing as drivers moved the shipment. From the command center, Haddon and Jenkins kept watch of the whole operation. There were hundreds of ways the truck stop scenario could go wrong. With the undercover agents' lives on the line, there was no margin for error. The cocaine was divided in two loads. Williams escorted one, Davis followed the other. They shepherded the couriers to the edge of town, shielding them from other drug gangs and from the law. To make it easier for our surveillance, we had one of the uh, courier cars go to the east and one go to the west because we had two complete surveillance teams operating simultaneously, and we didn't want the two to get crossed up with each other. The operation went off without a hitch. Six additional cops were videotaped in the act of drug trafficking. The FBI was about to enter the last phase of Shattered Shield, arresting the corrupt cops who would kill anyone who opposed them. After the big truck stop operation, FBI agents moved quickly on the murder of Kim Groves. They searched the house of the hitman, Paul Hardy. There, agents found an unauthorized copy of a guide to police codes, the same codes that Davis used when he ordered Grove's murder. Another search at the home of one of Hardy's accomplices turned up the murder weapon, a nine millimeter handgun. The two investigations, Shattered Shield and the murder, were closing at the same time. For the ringleaders, the FBI took no chances. Agents came to Len Davis's house the next day when he was off duty. Look, I ain't done that. What are you talking about? Look, I'm a police officer, man. The thug with a badge was arrested on federal drug charges and for the murder of Kim Groves. For Davis's partner, Sammy Williams, agents would use a different approach. Haddon wanted to flip Williams to the prosecution side. It worked. And they decided, okay, let's uh, throw another curveball and then let's just bring Juan in. So they brought me into the door and I introduced myself, especially to Juan Jackson, the FBI. You could see the, the color leave his face. And his world just came crashing down. Sammy Williams turned government witness. His testimony would later prove crucial for getting convictions. Haddon and his team had no time to lose. Before news of Davis and Williams' arrests could spread, they had to deliver the rest of the gang to justice, dozens of armed men in uniform. The strategy we were to employ was to arrest Lynn Davis on December the 5th. And then uh, on December the 6th, we had all of these officers appear before a federal grand jury. And then on December 7th, the grand jury ordered all these officers to come to the FBI office to give handwriting exemplars. Len Davis's recruits arrived at the FBI's office to give handwriting samples for analysis together with 60 fellow officers. Mm -hmm. 
Since the drug ring involved no written records and so many officers provided writing samples, the crooked cops suspected nothing. Like the others before it, the FBI's ruse worked. One by one, more than a dozen dirty cops of New Orleans were arrested. That, that was a safe way to do it because obviously all of these officers were armed and they were facing very serious charges and, and that was a way to do it to avoid any potential for uh, any bloodshed or any uh, unwanted uh, uh, resistance by the officers. In court, the FBI's recordings build a solid case against the officers. Are you aware we have hours and the videos hours and audio tapes spoke louder than the code words and erased all doubts that jurors might have had. Agent Karen Jenkins knew the evidence was strong. The jury was able to hear for themselves what the officers said. They were able to see for themselves what they were doing because of the videos that we had. That wasn't me. It could have been anybody. As Prosecutor Al Winters had predicted early in the investigation, Davis tried to talk his way out of it. All police officers know what that is. It's a homicide. Even after all the safeguards we took, Davis's defense at the trial was that he was conducting his own undercover operation, that uh, it was not really done according to the book, but, you know, he was a, a poor uh, uh, cop and didn't have a lot of training, but he was trying to conduct his own undercover operation. Davis never admitted any wrongdoing. He didn't need to. The audio and videotape spoke for themselves. Faced with the prospect of convicting those sworn to protect them, the citizens of the jury listened intently. The tapes were, were chilling, and as those tapes were played, uh, uh, the courtroom was as silent as, as a cathedral. Has the jury reached the verdict? Yes, Your Honor, we have. Will the defendant please stand? The jury deliberated just 15 minutes. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree and hereby sentence the defendant... Len Davis was sentenced to death for his role in Kim Grove's murder, which was later commuted to life. In two other trials, Davis and his co-conspirators received 18 convictions for drug trafficking. Fifteen officers were headed for prison. Because he cooperated with prosecutors, Sammy Williams was sentenced to just five years. He would never again wear a badge. You have irrevocably stained that uniform you once wore. But I must reluctantly recognize that other crimes can only be solved with cooperation of people like you. Court dismissed. For the Big Easy, Haddon's case brought a long, hard look in the mirror. You know, I think that the city of New Orleans has been very tolerant of all sorts of, of uh, conduct uh, which might be considered improper in other parts of the country. It's part of the culture here, and I'm a Louisiana native. Uh, but I think this was a wake-up call to the citizens of New Orleans that there was a serious problem within the NOPD, and that problem had to be addressed. You know, you take an oath, and I think that when you do that, uh, there's no excuse uh, for anything else. I think we helped. I think that uh, now their focus is different. I think hiring, I think pay scale, I think everything about what the New Orleans Police Department is about is different. Under Chief Pennington, the New Orleans Police Department revamped its practices and fired more rogue cops. The Big Easy had cleaned house. The department and the FBI continue to work together to bring justice to the city's streets.